one of the things I'll ask you to do before we start, since it is called mindful birding, um, is either open a window, take a minute to look outside, um, just notice if there's, you know, movement. Generally, when you see, when there's movement that crosses your path outside these days, it's a bird. Um, you know, if you, if you can open the window, I'll see you walk away and I'll wait a minute for you. Um, you know, and if you don't have that ability, um, I'll get you to just think and reflect on a time when you were either watching or listening to birds and maybe an experience that um, inspired you to come to the talk today. Um, sorry, I'm like, I'm just screen mirroring and but I think I don't even need to so. Um, It's just, I've got people dinging to get, be admitted to the meeting like um, regularly here. Um, so it's hard to take a mindful approach for a few minutes, but um, hmm, I don't know how long, I wish there was a way to just let everybody join automatically. Mute. Okay, I'm not gonna mute everyone on entry. Um, enable waiting room, unmute themselves. I know there's a way to just let people enter, but I don't remember. <laughs> Allow participants to your video. Let's see if that helps. Oh God. If anybody knows how to just let people join automatically, please tell me. Um, because I don't know how long this is going to go on for. Uh, meeting. Let's go on the start share, pause recording. You know what? I think it's a setting that's been set by OFNC that I won't be able to change. So I'll do my best to ignore it and just uh, <laughs> periodically let people come in. Um, Okay, so um, I had just asked uh, people to, you know, whoever's able to go open a window or um, if you're able to take a look outside and just take a moment to bear with me, you know, take a deep breath. I need to take a deep breath because <laughs> I'm a little nervous. It's very different doing it on Zoom, especially knowing that you're being recorded. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm sitting here. It's a beautiful sunny day. I've got activity at my bird feeders. Um, I have a lot of bird feeders, which reminds me I will come to this topic later. But there is a big movement towards making um, windows safe for birds, and I'll come back to that. But it's it's really important and. I could do a whole meeting on the, you know, disappearance of literally hundreds of millions of birds from the radar, uh, largely due to caps, provision by caps and windows. So I'll, I'll just, um, so yeah, so that's a side topic. I have a, um, a little water fountain, not fountain, but bird bath. Um, there's a, I could do a whole topic too on keeping your feeders clean and your water, you know, fresh, but the, the sounds of the birds are starting to quiet down. But the first thing I will say as uh, beginner birders is start getting outside now, because once the leaves come out on the trees, it becomes much harder to mm. um, locate birds. And right now, there's a lot. There's a lot of bird song out there, but it's not overwhelming. Um, you can find some of the um, some of the first arrivals, um, some of the usual suspects: Canada geese, um, mainly ring-billed gulls, um, northern uh, northern common grackles, red-winged blackbirds, uh, sparrows. Uh, some people will know the birds I'm talking about. 
um, some people won't. Uh, I'm sort of assuming that there's a, you know, you've at least noticed uh, the birds outside your window or when you're on a walk and you're curious about them. Um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of different species, but, and it's, it's hard to digress, but there's something called uh, backyard birds that tend to be the ones that you'll see most commonly around your home. Um, but I'm going to go, now that the dinging of people trying to get in has mainly stopped, I'm going to go back to the um, taking of deep breath. And again, those who are able to be near a window or uh, have a window open, just notice any, any sounds. It doesn't matter if you know what it is. But mindful birding is, um, to me, being aware of those sights and sounds. Um, as I um, became, uh, started birding more and more and learning about the importance of listening and looking, um, I really experienced this. Um, I mean, I've been birding for about 13 years, but <laughs> sorry, I see a cat, which is really cute. Um, um, Seriously, I, I forget everything over the fall and winter, and then I pick up again in the spring, and some of it I will have retained, some of it not. The peak of my birding was probably before my son was born in 2015, and after that, it all went downhill. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I'll ever get back to the same level of birding. Um, I was really good on warblers, and that's a whole thing in itself. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm still hoping that I can regain some of that knowledge. So uh, I will make, I can say I will make mistakes in naming birds. I make mistakes in saying the name of the bird I'm looking at. Uh, I have had health challenges, which has limited my ability to even raise my binoculars, look up in a tree. Um, thankfully, my hearing is perfect. Um, but there's some challenges, limitations, even, um, memory or just what comes out of my mouth before I think. Um, so I do make mistakes and if I make any here, forgive me. Um, if you have any burning questions, um, down the road, please feel free to use the chat function, by the way. Um, I'll take a look at those after the main spiel and, um, yeah. Also, if I get off topic too much, I keep doing that. <laughs> um, so I will ask you for now to mute your microphones. Most people are, but I see Ellen and Slavi are not. Um, I get distracted way too easily anyway. So um, if you want to just close your eyes and if you don't have a window or you don't hear birdsong, I just want you to take a moment to think about either the moment or some of the moments that compelled you to say to yourself, I want to know more about birding. I want to learn about this bird or about how to identify birds. And I'll give you a minute just to, or a few seconds to uh, bring that to the forefront of your mind. And while you're doing that, I'll share that my bird was probably about 20 years ago, being in suburban Orleans. I was in a university. Um, I had never really lived in suburbia. And I saw this stunning yellow bird at a bird feeder. And I was sure I had found this incredible rare bird and I went racing downstairs to where I knew there were some bird guides and I was trying to find this bird in a book and I, I just felt this elation when I found at least two options that it could have been and it was an American goldfinch and you can open your eyes anytime you like and um, try to stay with that that feeling that 
uh, that joy, that um, excitement about, you know, learning and experiencing the birds around you and even the bird songs. Um, so this goldfinch um, turned out to be a very common bird. And I, I was really just amazed because I had never noticed that birds in the spring just burst into color. Um, and being a northern climate, having harsh winters, we don't see a lot of birds over the winter. And in the spring, migration brings these wave after wave of all different types of birds that are usually coming here for breeding, for the express purpose of, of breeding grounds. And it took uh, probably another eight, seven or eight years before I actually um, searched for a, a course uh, to learn about birding. And I wanna just say here that um, most of the credit for what I've learned and what I know goes to um, a well-known birder in the area named Bruce DeLabio. Unfortunately, he has retired, but I took his spring and fall course every year for about 12 years, and I will miss it very much. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of other, um, at least one or two other um, birders who do offer courses, and I'd encourage you to ask around, look around. I'm not going to mm -hmm. um, bring it up here, but um, that's something I really encourage you to do. And what else can I say um, in general about uh, just holding on to that, uh, that joy and that passion that, that brought you here today, for example? Because um, I, I re-experience it uh, even when I see a chickadee, um, just being, being close to that. Um, one of the things I've learned is that um, part of why um, that it's, it's special to have birds so close to us and noticeable because since they have the gift of flight, they're not that in, as intimidated as other wildlife to be in the proximity of humans. And again, anything I say here could be wrong. This is my personal experience and things I've heard around, but maybe haven't bothered to verify on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, so from my understanding, uh, that's really precious. It gives us uh, access to uh, close, closer experiences with wildlife that we really don't get with, for example, mammals and other creatures. So I, I consider that really special. Um, so I'll get it, I'll, I'll move away for a minute from the um, sort of abstract, uh, warm and fuzzy birding part. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead to um, what do you need to go outside? Um, what sort of basic equipment do you need? Um, really, you need your eyes and ears uh, and your um, conscious awareness to, to notice uh, movement in trees and, um, and sound. But I think you're probably here because you'd like to go to the next level. And I am wearing my binoculars right now with uh, what's called a harness. Uh, it keeps them accessible on the front of you at all times. Um, and as far as what type of binoculars you get, you might want to take notes. Um, this is being recorded, so you can go back to it. Um, the most important thing is that they are what's called an 8 by 42 magnification. Uh, there are, I've seen people with other types of binoculars, but I'd say 99% of the birders I know use an eight by 42 binocular. I can't get into the technical reasons why there's different light penetration and uh, focal points to allow you to see certain distances. Um, as far as cost and, and brand, um, the three main brands I know of and use are um, for what's called entry level and some people may be shocked but the a good entry level pair of binoculars will probably cost about six hundred dollars um, birding equipment is uh, entry level all you the most important investment you make is your binoculars um, down the road people spend thousands uh, there are two thousand three thousand even more um, levels of binoculars I have routinely seen people using. But really, um, 
partly because I've lost two pairs of binoculars over 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, I stick to the six hundred, five, six hundred dollar binoculars. Um, so one brand that's very popular is the Nikon Monarch series. Um, you can check those out online. There's you can price uh, compare with different sources, or if you prefer, you can go to a store. Um, that's usually the best way, but it might be a little challenging given the circumstances right now. Um, another pair that's been introduced recently by uh, a company called Zeiss, uh, Z-E-I-S-S, -S, is the, the Terra E-D model. And they, I think they sort of came out to compete with the Nikon Monarch entry-level binocular. So um, those are the two types that I know of, uh, that I personally would use, and that have a price point that's accessible to most people. Um, if that amount is out of your reach, um, you might want to look at a used pair of binoculars. Or I, I really don't know, honestly, what else is out there below that price, uh, that cost that would um, be um, that would give you the um, the birding um, mag uh, focus that that you would need. But if anyone finds any, please tell me. Share with the group. Um, I will mention that I, I'm going to be probably referring to a lot of different resources, websites. Um, I'm going to try and find a way to post a reference page on OneDrive or something like that um, within the OFNC sphere. And I can't, unfortunately, get everybody's email address and send it to everyone. But um, I'll try to, you know, if you want to look for it over the coming weeks, I'm going to try and get something like that posted for you. Uh, so, we're, yes, equipment. So that's the absolutely number one investment that you'll make. And beyond that, really, the only other thing you need to get is a bird guide. A you know, it's not, it doesn't fit easily into your pocket. Uh, you will, to take it with you on walks, you'll probably need either a fanny pack, the, the uh, very fashionable fanny pack, or uh, what I would suggest is a cross body bag, because you want it, a backpack isn't that practical because you want it accessible in front of you. Um, so moving into guides away from binoculars, um, there are, I would say three main types that I would recommend or that I know people use um, the most in the field. Um, you know, one of which being the uh, Sibley Field Guide to Birds of Eastern North America. Um, that's really important is Eastern North America. Um, west of the Rockies are, you, you generally it would be a rarity to see birds in this region that are from that area. It helps narrow things down a bit. It's, you know, it's not exactly um, minimal birds, but um, at least for a guide you're carrying around, um, that is, um, that's pretty important when you're looking. Don't end up with a guide that is all of North America. So there's the Sibley guide. Um, I have also a very old copy of the Peterson guide. And then there is the, I don't have the guide, but it would look something like this, the National Geographic um, Birds of Eastern North America. So I'd say those are probably the two most popular uh, would be Sibley and National Geographic. Some people like Peterson. Um, I would encourage you to ask around and find, see if you can look through um, one or at least two different books and see which one seems to work better for you. These are artists' renditions of birds that try to capture the, you know, an average, uh, the most common features that they can compile into a single bird. Because not every bird is identical. There's color variations, size variations um, that, so these um, drawings, some of them might speak more to your um, vision of the bird. Uh, so again, I, I like Sibley. 
Um, I've heard uh, more and more recommendations about National Geographic. Take a look at at least two, see which one works best for you. Um, once you pick one, try to have it with you at all times. Um, yes, there are tons of apps now. Um, there's something about taking out your phone uh, in the field that can, you know, sort of take away your awareness. I use my phone all the time. Don't get me wrong. Um, I some, I just seem to have it with me more when I'm not uh, deliberately going out birding. Um, I could talk on and on about apps on, on phones, but before I touch on that, um, I just want to stress how important a field field guide is, and even if you don't um, think you're going to be relying on a, a hard book copy, they're very important for learning the shape, size, um, general features of a bird, cross-referencing when you see a bird and you are not sure what it is, because it doesn't just give you a picture, it gives you reference information. And, and it's part of uh, learning sort of the next level of, of birding. Um, so if I were to go to apps, again, one of the best, I would say the almost the only and best app right now is again, Sibley's. Um, it costs, it used to be free. It costs around $25 now, I think, but it is an extremely worthwhile investment. Apart from the images of, it, it generally gives the male the female, the juvenile, and what the bird looks like in the spring versus the fall. And there's all sorts of reference information in there as well. But to me, the second most important feature beyond the image is the recordings of bird's song. Um, I have found that enormously helpful. Because um, the thing about bird song is, again, not every bird sings exactly the same way. And there are multiple uh, what they call vocalizations of a, um, from birds. There's the actual song that generally males use to their territory, uh, but then there's there's alarm calls. There are um, you know different um, different sounds that are made for different purposes. And again, this is a whole other area of you know, for you to look into depending on what interests you the most. Uh, the old days, I had this uh, CD collection, uh, Birding by Ear by Peterson Field Guides. Uh, there is also another brand, um, I forget the name of it. They do also produce bird guides, but it's um, lesser used. Um, and I, that, even though it's on CD, I'm sure they make it in another format now. It's also really helpful because it uh, compares bird, different bird songs that sound almost identical. Um, there's a whole group of birds that make single repeated sort of trilling bird songs. And it's very, <laughs> I still have challenges um, being sure of which bird it is. Uh, and a lot of that is experience with knowing, okay, what time of year is it? What habitat am I in? Is it high up in the tree? Is it low? Um, when you can't uh, find the actual bird to um, uh, secure the identification. So I really like uh, the idea of um, in your sort of passively or, you know, driving the car, um, can, you know, I don't think it takes away too much cognitive ability, um, but nothing compares to going outside and hearing the birds outdoors um, as well as whenever you can find the bird you're hearing take your binoculars try and locate it and i've been told and it does help when you actually are looking at the bird as it sings it penetrates your um your awareness and your senses much more than listening to a cd indoors or just hearing it from afar and that brings me to something else I wanted to touch on, which is um, what they call getting on a bird. <laughs> That's one of the terms of, of art, I guess you could say, where, um, you know, people, birders will say to each other, did you get on it? Oh, I'm on it, I'm on it, you know, and it means they've got it in their, 
in their binoculars, in their sights. And that's a whole, it's a whole skill in itself to locate a bird because they're a moving target. They don't stand still for pictures, generally speaking. Some do, um, but songbirds, I would say, are um, moving targets and something like a warbler, for example, they, they're, they don't, they're so <laughs> uh, flitty and um, they can be very challenging. And that's a skill that um, takes time and patience and practice. And so um, I would encourage you again, always have your binoculars on you. Always do your, like try, just try to get on the bird. And I'd say that the most important uh, factor is watching for movement. Uh, you, you're not sure which tree it's in, um, just stop. You don't need the binocular, binoculars in, in front of you all the time. Just use your eyes and, and look and watch. And hopefully while the bird, you know, you can see with your eyes when the bird is actually perched on a branch and sitting still, hopefully it will stay there long enough that you can, for example, one of the techniques, um, beginners are, um, or I was instructed to use is you keep your eye on the bird and you don't move. You bring your binoculars up to your eyes. And I have found that enormously helpful. Again, it's a skill. Um, but another technique is what I do is I will follow the trunk of the tree, assuming it's in a tree, um, with my binoculars up and scan to where I last saw the bird and just sort of wait to see, like maybe move slightly side to side, slightly up and down, wait to see if it might cross my, my field of vision. So as I say, that's um, something I encourage you to practice as much as you can. Uh, it is of course helpful when you're with um, more experienced birders that can help you out. One of the, just for information, background information, generally the birders I've been out with will use a clock face to give you an idea of where a bird is. So, you know, straight straight up 12 o'clock, a little bit to the right, two o'clock, in a, as far as a tree for reference. It really helps to learn the names of trees. <laughs> I have said like, okay, there's a deciduous tree, especially because the best time to bird is when there's no leaves on the trees. Um, so, it's, I have not really acquired a lot of knowledge in that respect. So I'm just terrible about saying, you know, the, the one with that forks off at the top into three parts or, <laughs> you know, it's two behind the one in front of us. Um, that's okay too. You know, it, it depends on what your aspirations are with birding. Um, sorry, I'm just looking outside. If you see me look away as we're, um, as we're talking. Um, so practice, practice, more practice whenever you can. If sitting and looking out the window, have your binoculars accessible, keep them somewhere that you can find them easily, keep them out. Um, you see something, it could be a sparrow, a blue jay, a robin. Robins are great because they're always, they're on the ground. They're usually on the ground looking for worms. They uh, don't move that quickly. They're easy to, to zoom in on and they're really interesting birds. Um, I've been told that, um, and I've seen that, um, several pairs of robins may nest in a very close area to each other. Um, another interesting thing I learned about birds when I was trying to learn about bird song is they have this incredibly huge, uh, very, uh, spectrum of variation in their song. Um, Something I was referred to, you know, again, it depends what your main interest is. If you're really passionate about bird song, um, the, I don't know if it would be called the Bible, but there's a book by someone named Jer uh, Donald Krudzma. And he has, his specialty is studying bird song. And uh, a big part of his book was talking about his studies of the American Robin. And again, the, and that book actually comes with uh, a CD. If any of you still have <laughs> CD players, I think I do, a lot of people still do. And uh, so that is, was very interesting to me to even learn about um, bird dialects. 
in different regions, the same bird can mainly sound the same, but have a very distinct dialect in a different region. Um, chickadees on uh, wherever Martha's Vineyard is are, are known to have a very distinct dialect. And I, I find that really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just get a funny story about birdsong. When I was, uh, let's see, it was 2010 and I was actually in labor with my daughter and my doula was walking down a trail with me, uh, just sort of um, keeping moving. And I had been birding at that point for about three years and I was bent over in a contraction. <laughs> and as it subsided, I popped my head up and said, red-breasted nuthatch, <laughs> because I had heard it sing. And um, I love telling my daughter that story. It was, um, yeah, it was, it kind of uh, firmly cemented my um, commitment to, to birding. Uh, another interesting thing, when you start to pay attention to birdsong and learn more about it, is TV shows and movies. Um, I've heard a lot of birders say that um, one of the most common sounds you hear is the, the eagle's cry in a show or a movie. Nine times out of 10, it's a red-tailed hawk because <laughs> the eagle sound is not terribly majestic. So uh, I thought that was really interesting to learn. And um, I've noticed that oftentimes the, the bird song when you see an image is not the accurate bird song. Uh, or I'm watching a show or a movie and I'll say, oh, that was a song sparrow. Or I just heard a, you know, um, a wood thrush. And it just, it gets under your, your skin when you are passionate about it. And I just laugh at myself. Um, by the way, a really good movie to watch for some fun is called The Big Year. And it has some good actors in it. And I heard after it came out, I remember watching a group of advanced, very senior birders talking about what a mess they made of um, a certain bird identification. And um, in one scene where there were a number of different species of birds, they were saying, oh, yeah, they pointed out X bird, but they missed, you know, the more interesting birds. And it kind of portrays the a bit of the obsessiveness of more uh, ser of very serious birders who keep something called a life list. They're very in intense about um, keeping a record of every bird they have ever, every species of bird they have ever been gotten on or got on uh, with a positive identification. And they may also have um, uh, I think it's called a bucket list. Birds they they really want to find and see in their lifetime. Um, so you may be interested in that aspect of birding of the more, I don't know, sometimes it's competitive, sometimes it's just, um, so I'm just looking at the time here. Okay. Um, so that is something I do encourage you though to just generally keep keep a list of the birds you've seen um, look them up, confirm the identification. It's fairly easy with common birds. And, um, you know, if you, if you can, um, get to know them a little better. <coughs> that is something I wanted to mention too, is something called, um, alpha, I think it's called alpha codes. I wrote it down, but there is a, a four letter uh, code for every bird species in at least in North America. It's been expanded somewhat. And it takes the first, like I would say 90% of birds have two names. So American Robin, Common Grackle, Red Winged Blackbird, Great Blue Heron, that's actually three names, but usually it takes the first two letters of the first word and the first two letters of the second word and that becomes that bird's code that's worth exploring if you're interested because it makes a lot it makes it a lot easier when you're um, taking notes in the field or writing down the birds that you saw on a given day um oh someone entered the waiting room okay so i was just talking about bird codes letter codes for bird names and oh someone also sent a chat just a sec 
Uh, oh, okay. Um, I'm just going to close that for a second. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, bird codes. <laughs> so learning bird names, uh, aside from bird codes, it is pretty important to learn the, the full name of a bird. Uh, get used to thinking and saying not just robin, grackle, whatever, but um, you don't have to use it all the time, but to know at least um, both names of a species is important. And um, let me see, where can I go from here? I'm, I'm going to step back for one sec. The, the question someone asked was about using binoculars with glasses. Um, I don't wear glasses, so um, I'm not certain. There is, um, with the eyepiece, they turn, they twist and turn. You can, uh, they're sort of telescopic. They can be turned to come extend more or to go in more. And I believe that when you extend them out, it's easier with glasses, but it could be the opposite. I don't remember. Um, it could be just a matter of practice of uh, where, how far you hold them from your eyes. But I, I can't be more specific than that other than um, knowing that there is that adjustability of the eye, the eye pieces. Um, and, and on that note, just going back to binoculars, they do adjust to uh, in and out to the um, width or the spacing of your eyes. I never thought my eyes were particularly close together, but I have to have them pretty much as tight, <laughs> as, tight as they go. Um, and when you're locating birds to get used to having your, your index finger or another finger on the focus dial, um, because you're going to be zooming in and out um, very regularly when you are uh, looking at a bird. That's something I um, should have mentioned earlier as well. So again, I'm sorry I can't um, be more specific about using glasses, but I will ask and see if I can offer something. But I always say Google it. <laughs> That's I do that with so much now. Something I want to know the answer to, I, I Google it. Um, let me see. Where to look for birds if you're interested in uh, going beyond your backyard or your, your neighborhood. The uh, most common place by far in Ottawa is Mud Lake. Um, it is near the, the uh, Britannia filtration plant and the Britannia Yacht Club, I think it's called, or Sailing Club. Um, I'm not even going to try right now to tell you the names. Uh, it's on Castles, C-A-S-S-E-L-S. Uh, from this point forward, probably until July, the place will be a zoo. Uh, I'm sure Bylaw will be visiting there to try and um, control uh, the proximity of people. Um, I am going to miss this year um, the that uh, sort of um, congregation of uh, of birders and um, even sometimes photographers and the the excitement in fi finding something that's less common, uh, especially during migration, something might just be passing through and it doesn't live here. And so you have that one opportunity to look at it. And I would say to generalize, birders are pretty, pretty friendly. They're pretty um, um, willing and able to share um, a bird that they see or that they have seen in the area. And that's another thing I love about birding is just the, the encounters with other people and uh, sharing that moment of finding uh, a less common bird. Uh, Julie, you look a little perplexed. Is there something I can help you with? No, okay. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things I love about, about birding and uh, hopefully in not too distant future, we'll be able to go out in groups again. In the past, I have hosted um, a beginner birding walk in Mud Lake and um, I, I just love it. I, I really get excited about birding and I love, I love helping people get started on their journey or taking the next step on their journey. I am not a birding um, I, I don't even like to say that I'm an advanced birder. I like to say I'm, I'm somewhere uh, in the middle of, or I, I, I'm more than a beginner birder, but there is there are so many um, 
much more experienced, advanced, incredibly knowledgeable birder in the Ottawa region, in this neighbor, in, in, even in the general, uh, within a 25 kilometer radius of downtown Ottawa, and especially uh, members of the OFNC who are very generous with their time and um, and with outings. So I, I know I'm I'm like still tip of the iceberg. Um, what I can say is there's an expression my father used to like to say uh, was there's what you know, there's what you don't, and then there's what you don't know you don't know. <laughs> so when you're um, starting to learn, you start to learn a lot more about what you don't know and, and how much more there is to know. And as you progress, the part where you don't know what you don't know gets less and what you know gets more uh, uh, increases and what you realize you don't know but would like to know more about also increases. Uh, so your path can might take different. I know beginner birders that have advanced very quickly. They're able and uh, motivated to get out uh, on a very frequent basis. Uh, they they read up on things. They uh, consult their guide. They they practice. They study. Uh, they you know very quickly uh, become immersed in it uh, in a more technical way or in a more you know somewhat com I don't want to say competitive but um, I'm not sure how you describe it but uh, keeping lists and developing um, uh, goals and and things like that for their their birding. I'm still, uh, something I've learned, I, I did peek out with uh, really, I, I wanted to learn warblers. I found them, I find them so challenging and the way they change from uh, spring colors to fall color, uh, sorry, it's not colors, uh, plumage or coloration um, is, don't even ask me about fall warblers. I'm still uh, trying to re regain the knowledge I had pre baby number two on um, on the warblers I did know pretty well. Um, oh, and that brings me to another topic, which is, um, I know I, I might be jumping around, but every time I get on to something else I wanted to chat about, I'm gonna switch to it. And then uh, please feel free to send a chat um, with questions or something you'd like me to go back to, and I'll do my best to do that uh, in a bit. So with something like warblers, uh, the, birds their bird song as well as coloration is is challenging there i think we're very blessed to have a pretty wide number of warblers that come in and breed here and the opportunity to see them is really um i would say i'm not sure if it's too late late april may and they say by by about June, most birds are on their nest, and the the frequency of um, of singing and you have leaves out on the trees it drops significantly. So that's why I say get out now, get out as much as you can. Um, if you have someone in your bubble, you can get out with. Um, that is very you know two sets of eyes are better than one. Um, I am hoping to. Uh, bring a small group of people. It'll be a very small number of people out to somewhere like Mud Lake and do a little a personal walk around. If I can, I'll do it more than once. Um, that's an aspiration. I'm not sure if it will materialize. So there's um, some tools that I have found uh, as you progress in your, in your birding. I don't, everyone's at a different level. There are some quick reference guides that I find um, have been very useful for me. Um, I've only, I've really been focusing on uh, songbirds, but some other areas that are also equally um, inspiring and is, um, and they're also important, even if you're not interested in them, um, I was really encouraged by my, I call Bruce my bird guru <laughs> because he's, he just, yeah, I just, uh, you know, always seeking him out for uh, questions, uh, help, um, suggestions, advice uh, in my birding. And um, so there are hawks, 
Um, and again, I am not technical. So there's uh, raptors, occipiters. There, you know, there's the uh, the three main falcon-like um, species we have here are. Par we actually have peregrine falcons, which are incredible to to see. Uh, merlins and American kestrels. I have girl gir falcon here in my list, but they are much less common. Um, so there's accipiters and buteos, B-U-T-E-O-S. And so I'm not sure if they're all caught in the name raptors. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know. Um, but I've heard people say, oh, raptor as a general term. This is a very handy reference I found, uh, which shows the, uh, the sort of silhouette of what you might be seeing overhead, as well as uh, the shape and um, pattern of the uh, plumage of the bird from, uh, from the underside, because that is most often uh, what you see. So this ear, this is a bald eagle, and where's the other one? And, uh, and there's again, as you get, there's the immature bald eagle and the golden eagle. I'd say the most common bird you're going to see in this size category is the turkey vulture, and they are they're great because they're they're often um, I don't know if I would say common, but they're easy to spot because they have a wing shape that they call a dihedron um, and they're very wobbly. They're, they don't fly sort of, they don't fly in a smooth pattern. They, they sort of circle around and along with that wing shape, they're, they're sort of always tilting and they're pretty easy to spot um, when you're, you know, paying attention driving, you'll see them, you know, they're usually looking for roadkill <laughs> or some other decomposing animal in a field. So, and you usually see more than one at a time. And they're, I, I like, I find them fun to watch. They're not the prettiest bird to see up close, but um, so that's a, a whole other category of birds that I believe right now, there's a, even a whole uh, hawk watch, um, I don't know, it's not really a project, but there's a group of people I know of that get together every year with um, folding chairs and they just sit and hang out and watch for hawks. And I've wanted to do that every year, but I still haven't got out to do it. Um, I, something just interesting I've heard is in other parts of the world, you can see very large groups of migrating hawks, which I think is so cool. Um, so I brought this out really as a way to show some of the reference guides that are out there that are very, very helpful. Um, but uh, before I show some of the other examples that I have, uh, it is really important when you have the opportunity to get to know uh, beyond songbirds. Um, if you're ever um, with someone who has a, a scope, who's looking at water birds, if you're able to get close enough, uh, two of the best places for water birds, I would say, is uh, Andrew Hayden Park, Shirley's Bay, and um, parts of uh, the Mud Lake zone. And um, there's a part uh, across the river in Gatineau. And there's probably one or two other <laughs> getting right now. But um, whenever you can go to a shoreline and look out at the water, that's also a really, uh, I'd say second to songbirds, a really, another really great way to um, look at birds, get to know their shape, their behavior. Uh, there are two main types of water birds, and I'm probably not even using the right term when I say water birds, but uh, there are diving ducks and dabbling ducks. I find it exciting just to even see um, whether a duck is dabbling or diving. Um, mallards are dabbling ducks, you know, you'll, they're swimming along and then their, their bum, bum goes up in the air because they're sticking their head down, nibbling at grasses and they pop back up. But <laughs> something I learned early on, sometimes they dive. Um, so that there's always that caveat that a, a bird might do something unexpected that is not typical of the species. That's just something to always remember when, when you're not sure about a bird or confused because yeah, very early on I saw a mallard do that and then I wasn't sure if it was a mallard anymore. Um, it is also really fun to practice using your binoculars with diving birds because they dive under and they, they might pop out a very far distance away. 
and practicing uh, focusing your binoculars, looking for birds out on the water at a distance is also a really big, great skill to develop. Um, another really fun category of birds, one of my favorite category of birds to watch are shorebirds. Uh, that includes um, sandpipers. I just for sandpipers and plovers are the two main groups that I uh, have seen and sort of know, and they're just so funny to watch. They're they're just so the way they walk. Uh, some of them with the longer uh, bills. Um, water birds generally you refer to uh, as having a bill, and um, land birds usually it's a beak. Just by the way. So one of the best places to look at shorebirds um, was uh, out near Shirley's Bay, but unfortunately it is closed. The second best place is off of the eastern end of Andrew Hayden Park. Uh, I've heard it referred to as the mud flats. I've brought a chair out there and just sat and, and just watched. Um, sometimes they're at a distance, something they, sometimes they get closer. I still have a miserable time with ID, except for the most common species, because a lot of them just look alike. They're kind of brown, brownish birds. They might have a, a ring around their neck or a band around their neck or a different bill shape. Some of the two easiest ways to identify birds. Um, I'm going to just skip over to something I wanted to say, I wanted to touch on um, and get it, which is sort of backing up which is another really crucial skill is learning the main parts of a bird and, and the correct way to refer to it. You know, easier, easy ones like tail, um, you know, head, beak, um, wings, but there is a, a whole world of study for you uh, in terms of learning the, the feather names or the more specific uh, parts of a bird. And I will show you what they call um, passerine birds, which I believe means perching birds. Um, you can see that uh, there are numerous uh, feather names to learn that do help very much when you down the road with birding. Um, most bird guides you buy, the, this is in my Sibley bird guide will have um, that reference and you, there's a whole world online as well. Um, head feathers alone, <laughs> I don't know most of them. Uh, the ones I hear most commonly are crown, um, the, the lores, super laurel, um, malars, cheek, but yeah, I usually just uh, fake it and then there's, you know, different feathers are in view depending on how you see it when it's in flight. Um, I have even banded, uh, participated or volunteered in banding birds, and I still don't remember primary, secondary, tertiary wing feathers, wing co coverts or coverts. So I, I don't need to say any more about that because it can get overwhelming. I still have not taken the time to really Oh, study all that. Um, right, so bird feathers is, yeah, it's also a very interesting um, part of learning to bird. Depending on your interests, again, you may want to explore that more, you might not. Um, back to warblers, I found a really cool guide. It is a quick ref laminated quick reference guide. There are all kinds of these. I found this one in Point Pelee, I believe, and it folds out and it's, it's really the most common warblers in Eastern North America. And the reason I like it is um, it shows, um, so for example, this bird that's full breeding plumage and It'll, it'll show the, what the juvenile looks like, what the female looks like. Again, that can get overwhelming. When I started and still now, I mainly focused on learning the male bird 
and uh, the you know they tend to be the most brightly colored and the easel, most easily found because they're typically the um, bird that's singing the loudest or um, prettiest. When I was uh, looking up topics for today, I found uh, there's a whole area of study of female bird song um, that has been considered very neglected and understudied. Um, really since the beginning of um, birding as a spar sport or pastime, uh, the focus, it was assumed that only male birds sing. And I know that um, the Northern Cardinal, the female bird sings as well. There are a few other common birds that um, truly, I guess, sing in the sense that they use the same vocalization as the male. However, there are, there's a whole world of female bird song and a movement to have that recognized and, um, and studied. So I thought, I, I really didn't know that that was, um, that, that existed. I only knew that there were a few birds that um, sing in the same way as male birds. So I see that it is almost 11 o'clock. There are nine questions. Um, I'm clearly not gonna get to look at, uh, cover everything I wanted to, to say. But um, I just glanced at one thing, which is something really important I wanted to say. Birding etiquette and birding ethics. When you're out birding, be mindful also of the animals that you are trying to find. Watch where you step. Try to keep a low voice if you're talking. Move quietly try to make sure you're not trampling over um, plants or uh, maybe sensitive other um, plant species. Um, really, if you go to the OFNC site, you'll find a whole, um, there is a whole uh, page about uh, birding code of ethics. Um, but generally, it's just about, you know, being, trying to be quiet, um, as well as etiquette around other birders. You try not to walk in front of someone's, someone who's looking through their binoculars as much as possible. Uh, sometimes it's unavoidable. You just pause and then you try to make a quick pass, pass by. Um, so I encourage you to go and check out that, um, that resource on the OFNC site. Um, so that was something really important. Of all the resources you can find online, the place to start is the um, Cornell University Lab of Ornithology webpage. There is so much on there and they offer actual online courses. Um, there are, there's even uh, like a sort of game you can play that helps you learn the bird parts and, and feathers. Um, I did um, uh, make a list of some of the more interesting web websites that I found. And again, I'll try to put that up somewhere that you can all access. Um, so someone said, what are the best places to buy bird books? Uh, you can go to Indigo, but I, I, I say, I, I recommend, I don't want to say I recommend, but Amazon is a very good resource. Sometimes they might have better prices. Oh yes. An important thing, get the most, the latest edition of the book. Uh, whatever book you're looking for, try to check online to see what was the most recent edition put out. Because when you're especially shopping somewhere like Amazon, it might be cheaper because it's an old, um, an old uh, edition. Um, so that's places to buy bird books. Uh, some uh, bird f uh, someone's asking about when to put out hummingbird feeders. Uh, learning more about bird feeders in general. Um, I can get to that if we have time. Uh, where to find the raptor sheet. Um, I can try to put that on the site too. But again, most things, if you type a Google search, um, boy, do they ever have a monopoly on the world. Apple and Google. Oh. Um, you can usually find, you might find that resource or something similar to it. Um, Again, I can put that information in a reference um, thing. Um, someone's asking about the CD. I can put that in a sheet as well, but it's uh, the Peterson, uh, uh, Peterson uh, Field Guide Company. 
Uh, it's called Birding by Ear. Again, if you type in Birding by Ear, you'll just have a, a flood of information. Uh, someone mentioned the code of conduct for birders. Um, and the, oh, it says the Fletcher Wildlife Garden is having a big year for 2021. So go and take a look at the Fletcher Wildlife Garden uh, Big Year 2021 Facebook group and you can contribute. So usually that's sharing um, sightings of birds, um, making your own list of what you've seen in, in that period. Um, okay, so some people just saying thank you. I'll, um, what else was I going to say? Um, the, I, I showed you the um, Hawk Quick Reference. Um, I showed you the Warbler Quick Reference Guide. You know, I could go on and on. Um, I'm glad I can see one to six people's faces because everyone is just a name. So thank you to those who kept your camera on. It made it feel a little more personal. Um, I could say that about bird feeders, if those people are, or for you in general, um, the number one bird feeder I recommend is um, squirrel proof bird feeders. They're called Squirrel Buster. Uh, Wild Birds Unlimited is a store with a couple of uh, locations in Ottawa that sells them. You can also find them online to uh, compare pricing uh, because what happens, they, they don't only shut out squirrels because they're weighted and you can adjust the weight so that uh, heavier birds can't come and raid your bird feeder and completely deplete it. So uh, you can actually adjust uh, the weight of the, of the landing um, site for the birds. Uh, there's a, something called a tube feeder, and then there's more of a platform house-shaped feeder that attract different kinds of birds. The most important thing about bird feeders is where you place it in relation to your windows and, uh, keeping, and, and cleaning it occasionally. There are unfortunately um, diseases that can be spread easily between birds. Uh, so washing it occasionally, again, for more information, you can find uh, find that possibly on the safe, oh, yes, the safe, safewingsallinword.ca. Please take a look there for ways that you can make your windows safer for birds. There are two main ways. One is attaching something called Zen curtains. They're long strings. I haven't uh, put mine back up yet, which is really bad. But uh, the other type, if you can, no, I don't know if you'll be able to see them in the light here. Uh, you see those dots on my window. Um, it's a, there is a company that sell, they stick them on to your window. And those are, have been proven to prevent uh, bird collisions with windows. Uh, what happens is they see the reflection of trees or um, things like that, and they assume you know, the bird assumes that they can fly right right through it. And uh, I have very sadly had a number of bird collisions and deaths uh, at my windows. You can see it's a it's a huge um, <laughs> like bay bay window, and I do everything I can to prevent that in terms of where I put my feeders and uh, hanging different. Um, um, prevention devices for preventing bird collisions. If you have a cat, if you can't, if you do let it outside, all I can say is please, if you can keep it in during breeding, the main breeding season. So May, June, July, when baby birds are out fledging, trying to learn to fly. I'm sure everyone here is probably very responsible with things like that. But if you know of anyone who won't be offended, uh, personally offended by you uh, suggesting it to them, um, that's the, the really crucial time to keep cats indoors or put them out on a, you know, some sort of uh, <laughs> leash, leash in a harness so they can get outdoor time or build a little sun, uh, you know, a little wooden structure for them to sit outside. Uh, one new message. Um, yes, so the Squirrel Buster feeder is about $100. It's very expensive. I have found them on Kijiji. It's uh, someone shared that Richie's Feed and Seed sells uh, Squirrel Buster feeders at a good price. And uh, I do also recommend if you're going to go through a large volume of seeds, uh, Costco sells enormous bags of uh, sunflower seeds uh, for under $20. And it's the best price I've found anywhere, even compared to Richie Feed and Seed. And the other most important uh, food to provide is peanuts. Um, I think I, you can, might be able to see my 
peanut feeder up there and it's just a, a black metal tube with with holes in it i have about five of them <laughs> some of them are in the woods across the street because a couple of birders in the neighborhood are supplying the birds there right now and uh, peanuts and black sunflower black oil sunflower seeds you don't need fancy mixes uh you don't and you don't need a fancy bird feeder you you can also put something called a squirrel baffle at the the base of a pole or your tree to keep squirrels from being able to climb up. It is fun to see the lengths squirrels will go to to try and get on your feeder. Uh, we've had some trapeze artists and uh, very amusing experiences with that, um, but we, we do our best to try and keep them off because they can very quickly go through your uh, supply. Although there is something to be said for feeding them because they do actually raid birds' nests and eat uh, bird eggs and unfortunately baby birds. Um, and that helped me feel a lot, like a little less sad when I see them squished on the ground <laughs> by a car. Um, so, you know what, if you want to unmute or raise your hand, if there's anything you want to ask before we say goodbye, please feel free to do so. Anybody? No, no hands. Okay. Well, that's good. It means I covered a lot of uh, ground, I guess. And thanks for, thanks for coming. I really enjoyed that. And it would be great to meet some of you in person sometime or just um, cross paths out in the field. If you do go to Mud Lake, try to keep your, your distance, wear a mask. There's my public service announcement. Um, and OFNC webpage also has a listing of other sites you can visit for birding. I'd say Andrew Hayden Park, um, Dick Bell Park. The Dick Bell section is great for seeing water birds. The rest of it is great for um, perching birds, passerines, songbirds. And there's a lot more space than Mud Lake. So yeah, I, I'm gonna stop there or I'll, oh, Julie. <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, when do you think you might uh, take a small group out to do some birding? Would you be doing it during COVID or after vaccinations? Everyone's been vaccinated. No, we've, the club has uh, allowed very small numbers of people with a mask and with physical distancing. Um, I think it's limited to three or four people at a time. And it'll be announced um, with the next newsletter for um, April events. Okay. So I'm going to try in April and May to do as many of those as I can. Yeah. And, um, you know, it would be great if I could do it. <laughs> I'm not sure I'll have the energy um, from day to day, but um, I would. I'm hoping to offer that again because the season is short. It'll get me out too. And it just, it pumps me up and I love seeing the, the look on people's faces when they, you know, find a bird with their binoculars um, and get to know that skill or just, it's really a great uh, experience to share with others. So keep an eye out for the newsletter. I'll nail down some dates and that'll come out with the um, April events announcement. Okay, thank you. Oh, and uh, do you put peanuts in shell or out of the shell in your feeder? Out of the shell, um, okay. people, usually in shell is left for um, for squirrels. Yeah. Uh, the best price I've found uh, for peanuts is somewhere like Richie Feed and Seed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, you're you're spending more initially, but it's the the price is so much better when you buy a larger supply than anywhere else that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, so they're really important right now. Well, they're they're really important in the fall and winter when or fall when birds are trying to um, accumulate fat for the winter, um, but also important during the uh, breeding season. I've had um, so many families come to my peanut feeder um, during breeding season. A family of woodpeckers. Um, something must have happened to the mom because the dad would come. Uh, with his his fledgling, which was the same size as him, but he's still putting the peanuts in in its mouth uh, with the two of them on the feeder. And it's really precious uh, to see, you know, this big fat baby <laughs> who oh, he's yeah. to get his own peanuts and he's still getting uh, hand, uh, beak fed by the dad. Uh, I've had nut hatches do the same. Uh, they're easier to tell when one is a juvenile than an adult, but 
just watching what the uh, what one bird is doing with the other. Uh, baby birds make the most wonderful um, little uh, begging begging sounds too. So it's really <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you all for being here. It was a really great experience for me to uh, to see you all come and see your interest and and to share what I know and what I know I don't know. And um, yeah, thanks for coming. Wonderful. Okay. Enjoy the week and get out. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.